we'll be talking about surveys and surveys are one of the research strategies that many studies in social sciences use uh, even in hospitality and tourism we see that many many researchers are using surveys as a methodology or as a strategy to collect data now normally surveys are associated with deductive approach which means it's more like quantitative uh, based approach where we want to collect data from a large amount of sample uh, or a large amount of population in an economical way. So it's much quicker because you can send the survey simultaneously to a number of people. These days, especially with online platforms like Prolific or Amazon MTurk or things like this, uh, it's much, much quicker to collect data using surveys. Now, of course, not every research can be used uh, with survey methodology or survey strategy. Some of them uh, that use deductive approach, like quantitative approach, can use surveys as a data collection method. Now, usually for a survey, we need to use a questionnaire. So you need to develop a questionnaire. It can be on paper. It can be online. You need to use that questionnaire to collect data from a large population. And we consider, we call this whole process as a survey process. Usually in this process, researcher has a control over the data collection procedure. So if you think that somebody is not the right person to give you data, you can eliminate them from the survey or you can eliminate the responses after the survey is conducted. So there's more control for researcher in the data collection process. And then because it's much quicker to collect data using survey, normally it's it requires much more time before the survey. So when you are designing the questionnaire or when you are piloting the questionnaire, you need to spend a lot of more time to ensure that your data is collected in a proper way and then your data is usable for the further research steps. So much more time is required to be spent into the designing and piloting stage. Okay, so here is one example. Let's say if we look at this example uh, for one of my papers that is published in Journal of Travel Research. In this example, I wanted to look at how airport service scape have an impact on traveler dissatisfaction and misbehavior. So what do I do? I normally go and ask a lot of people who travel by air about what do they think of this research question. So I can develop a questionnaire. And normally, if you look at this side, we have variables like dissatisfaction, traveler misbehavior, and then we have several questions under each of this variable, right? So these are the questions that we put into the questionnaire and then uh, respondents can ask, respondents can answer these questions on the questionnaire. And this is something that is called as a survey strategy. Okay, so these are the questionnaires. So when we go ahead with the survey methodology, it's very important that we spend more time into developing the questionnaire. And how do we develop this questionnaire or how do we develop a survey? There are a few things that need to be considered. For example, we start with the list of research questions or the hypothesis and the variables involved. Now, why is it important is that because when you are putting together your questionnaire, sometimes uh, people overlook all the variables that are required to be measured into the study. It happened to one of my students once. Uh, this student uh, developed the model, everything is good. But when we went into the uh, proposal defense at that time, this student already collected some pilot data. When he was presenting, one of the committee members actually asked him, uh, hey, wh what, what about your dependent variable? How are you going to measure your dependent variable? And at that, at that time, we realized that we have overlooked uh, the data collected for the dependent variable. So we have actually missed including the questions for the dependent variable into the questionnaire. So it's very important when you start to put all your research questions or hypothesis and the variables involved into your study right in front of you so that you can ensure that the questions for these particular variables are included into your questionnaire. That's number one. And how do we do this? Uh, we actually don't go to Google Scholar and put the name of the variable and get the question is, uh, questions from any paper that come across you. It's very important that you look at the literature that you have reviewed for your study. And then from that literature, pick up some of the instrumental research papers 
about each variable and pick up your questions from there. Remember that the questions you put into your questionnaire should be actually in line with how you define those variables into your study. So your operationalization of the con concepts, like how are you going to measure them, should be very similar to how you define those variables into your literature review. After this is done, we make an outline. How do we make an outline? So first of all, we start with the introduction of the study. We need to add the study purpose so that our respondents know why we are conducting the study. We also need to put the rights of the participants in this first page or right at the start so that they know that they, they are um, they are participating in the survey voluntarily. If there is any incentive you are providing, that information need to go there. You also need to tell them about how much time will it take for them to complete this questionnaire. You also need to tell them if they can leave the survey without any pressure anytime they want. And all those type of things need to go first into your questionnaire, mainly in the cover letter or the first page of your questionnaire. Then after that, we need to decide if we are measuring behaviors or attitudes or perceptions or what are we actually measuring. So those type of things need to go there. And then in the end, you should normally put your demographics. Now, sometimes people put demographics in the start and that's fine to do that. I usually put them in the end because I don't want my uh, respondents to feel fatigued when I'm asking them questions about the variables of my study. So I normally put those questions in the start and then later I ask demographic questions. Um, then you need to decide whether you need some of the items or not. If you don't need some of the items, please disregard them. These days, it's very important that your questionnaire is as short as possible without compromising the quality of data, right? Because everybody is busy. People are getting a lot of emails, a lot of data requests and stuff like this. So you need to make sure that you are not creating fatigue for your respondents. Think about the length of the survey, right? So it's important. And also, Sometimes people put very short questionnaire. Like recently, I reviewed one paper where um, the, res the researchers were measuring service quality perceptions. And usually, uh, it's a multidimensional construct, meaning service quality has several different dimensions that need to be measured. And even if you go with a very small uh, scale, we are looking at somewhere around 15 to 20 questions to measure service quality. But, but this one study only used three questions. Okay, and these three questions are not sufficient enough to measure the quality of uh, surveys in any environment. So also when you are talking about the length of the survey, it's also important to consider whether you are really getting enough questions to measure that particular uh, particular item, particular construct into your study. There are actually different type of questions that we use in the questionnaire. One is qualifying and filtering questions. Both of them are actually um, uh, vice versa. So qualifying questions are basically about your sample, about the sample when you decide that you are going to collect data from a particular sample. For that um, sample, you need to use qualifying or filtering questions. So for instance, first of all, let's say if I want to collect data from people who eat at McDonald's. So of course, my first question would be, do you eat at McDonald's? That would be my qualifying question. Would that make people qualify for my survey or not? If anybody says no, then we exclude them from um, taking part into the survey. So those type of questions, or many times we collect data from people who are 18 years and plus. So in that type of situation, uh, age would be a qualifying question. So age meaning um, you ask a question, are you 18 year old or not? Uh, if they say no, you um, filter them out, you remove them, and then the rest of the people can be kept into your survey. So that's your qualifying and filtering questions. There's also scale questions. There's different type of scales. Usually we measure social constructs about people uh, based on scales. The most common scale used in the research studies these days is Likert scale, which starts from one polarizing end to another polarizing end. From, for example, strongly disagree to strongly agree, extremely unlikely to extremely likely, right? Something like this. And usually in this one, we measure intensity or intentions or things like this. Then we also have semantic differential skills in which we uh, measure attitudes or semantics or meaning of things. For example, 
um, what do you think about this restaurant? Good to bad, valuable to worthless. So these are again op opposing ends, but based on semantics or attitudes. And usually the best idea for a survey is to ensure that everything goes well, to pick up the skills from previous studies, but don't uh, mix and match. Pick up uh, the whole skill from one study. That way you can ensure its validity and also reliability. Some other measurement skills that we have or the type of variables that we have actually, we have three main types of variables. So one is called nominal, the other one is called ordinal, and then the third one is called interval. These are the three types of skills that we use normally with data collection. If you input your data in SPSS, so every time you create a variable, uh, SPSS is going to ask you to identify the type of skill. So you have to pick up either nominal, ordinal, or interval. Of course, they are all different, uh, a little bit different from each other. The first one is nominal. So nominal is a categorical skill, meaning it looks at categories of things, groups of things. For instance, when you ask somebody their gender, okay? So gender is male, female, undecided. These are all different type of things people use, but these are different categories, right? Or if you ask somebody about, uh, tell me your favorite hotel brands, right? Or which hotel brands do you prefer? So these are all categories. So nominal and ordinal are basically categorical uh, scales, whereas interval, overall scale type of variable, meaning you measure it on a scale, right? So now for nominal, basically it's categories, okay? Whereas for ordinal, uh, we normally look at it in terms of ranking. So where you ask somebody a question and give them a few options and ask them to rank them, we would consider it as ordinal. And an easy way to remember it is order. So putting things in order, that's how you can remember what does ordinal mean, right? And it normally shows how important is something for someone versus another thing. And then we have interval, which is basically converting the groups into numbers. So here we have numbers uh, on a scale where the, the distance between two points is equal, right? So we normally use Likert scale or semantic scale as interval scales. So we go ahead and look at how they are used into the studies for nominal scale you will see questions like gender, occupation, department of employees in an organization. These type of questions are called as nominal skills, right? For instance, as in one example, what type of restaurant you have you dined in most recently? Fast food restaurant, casual dining restaurant, upscale restaurant. So these are three categories. We call it as a nominal scale. And if somebody selects fast food or casual or upscale, it doesn't matter. It doesn't show any ranking or importance or anything. It's just three different categories. Whereas when we come into ordinal, in ordinal, we normally rank them. Okay, so for instance, we can ask people that these are the five dimensions of service quality. Which of these are most important for you? Rank them from one to five, right? So people are going to rank them in different way. So we know that if somebody is selecting one, they mean it's least important. If somebody is selecting five, it means it's most important. So this is what we have in ordinal. And then in interval, it's very simple. These are scales that we use to measure attitudes and perceptions. These are the most widely used questions or scales into social science research. For instance, we put a question and then we ask people if they strongly agree, strongly disagree or neutral or whatever, but it's like five point or seven point or nine point scale. Uh, when we use this type of scale, it's very important that we also study our sample. Which culture are we using to, uh, which culture are we going to collect data from or what type of people are going to respond to this scale and things like this. So that's another topic for another day, but interval scale is where we collect data based on a whole scale with different numbers on that scale that means something. Okay, then uh, the last thing about questionnaires, which is very important is how you word your questionnaire. So the way we ask questions would determine how people answer those questions, right? Very important. So number one is um, when we sometimes ask questions, some questions are group opinion. Uh, for instance, if you look here, the first question, it says travel offers great educational value. 
Whereas the second question says, I believe travel offers great educational value. So for the first one, it sort of shows the group opinion, like where the, your respondent is living, where, what do people think generally? Whereas the second question limits the person to provide individual opinion. This is important because if we are collecting data in a collectivist society, then I think the first a statement would be a better statement to use. Whereas if we are collecting data in an individualistic society, then the second one would be a better one to use. But it's not the only consideration we have to make. It's just something that we need to consider. Also be consistent. So I have seen many papers when I review them where in the same variable, there's five questions, two of them are group opinion, three of them are individual opinion. Don't do that. Be consistent in how you word your questions. Second one is negatives in sentences. Uh, that can be a bit confusing for people, especially if you are collecting data from countries where English is not the first language. So for instance, if I have to use this, uh, I believe travel offers great educational value. And if I reword it, I believe travel does not offer great educational value, something like this. It can be very confusing for people to make sense of it. So try to avoid negatives in your sentences as much as possible. Third one is direction of statements. So sometimes statements are positive, whereas sometimes statements can give a negative vibe to your respondents. Again, if you look at these two statements, they are measuring the same thing. Getting a good night sleep before an exam is helpful. Whereas the other one says staying up late, studying the night before an exam helps a lot. So both of them are actually saying the same thing, but the first one is more positive, right? Getting a good night's sleep before an exam is helpful. Whereas the second one says, staying up late, studying the night before an exam helps a lot. So it's a negative direction of a statement. So be sure of what type of variables you are measuring and how you should use the statements. And then the last one is double barrel question, which also creates a problem. For instance, it says, I love, I like ham and eggs. What if somebody likes eggs but not ham? What do they answer then, right? So in this type of situation, you actually miss the data point, the exact data point. So make sure that you avoid double barrel questions as much as possible um, and try to be as uh, simple worded as possible into your questionnaires. With this, um, I would say that this is pretty much it. These are some important considerations when it comes to developing your questionnaires. Um, make sure that you follow these opinions. Of course, this is just my personal opinions based on my understanding of things. Read as much as you can, but don't just go ahead and follow other people in how they develop their questionnaires. Do your homework, read as much as you can and make some good questionnaires so that you can have quality data for further analysis. Thank you.